Hello and welcome uh, to Build Series Sydney. I am joined by a very special guest, Australian songbird Jack River, aka Holly Rankin. Round of applause for the lady. Thank you. Uh, hello, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm great. It's really That's good great. to have you here uh, to talk about all things music and life, uh, but es especially the new EP. Look, I'm gonna I'm gonna come out and say it straight off the bat. Loved it. Uh, I absolutely love this EP. I think it's spectacular. You must be proud. Uh, do, do you feel you. a sense of, of pride when you put something a new uh, out into the world? I do. I feel like the process is complete once you kind of speak to speak to your listeners and like feel it out with them and it becomes a thing. Mm. I don't know. So I'm only three days into that process and, you know, even doing interviews makes you realise what you've done a little more because mm. it's a very – isolating process and then all of a sudden it's public and you're like oh okay. sure yeah so it, it feels beautiful but still still at the beginning okay yeah. i mean uh from the beginning of mm. stranger heart when you first hit play uh, you are taken on this in incredible journey it's like very otherworldly like you're, you're, you're watching some sort of, you know, fantastical film uh, and then you, you move off in, into the EP and it makes me wonder, why isn't this just a, a full album? <laughs> like this does feel like a oh. full body of work. Uh, did you decide to keep it nice and uh, shorter than, you know, normal? Yeah, I mean, I wish it could have been an album. I treated it like an album um, and I wouldn't treat anything otherwise because albums are that whole thing is really fun. Um, I don't know why it wasn't an album. I guess we wanted to just, we as in my team and I wanted to take a small break between the next major work, which I am working on. And I just had all the pieces of this together and ready. I mm. don't want to like bombard people because I haven't really stopped releasing music for a while. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, there are some really incredible motifs and, and thoughts and feelings. I mean, it's an emotional roller coaster because oh. it, it's love, it, it's letting go. It th There's so much going on here. So I wanted to know, do you have to be in a particular state of mind when you are writing a song about love? or you are writing a song about letting go, do you have to feel sad to project and, and deliver sad? Um, I feel like you do. I mean, I certainly, I write songs only when I'm feeling that thing. I don't, I'm not a kind of writer that sits around trying to write songs, which is awesome, but I just don't do that. I, I'm lucky that, uh, I don't know, found a process where I just trust that, Songs will come when they need to and especially with this EP, each song is really made like that. Like they were all coming um, on, yeah, I wrote them on a day that I f was completely engrossed in that thing. Mm. And, yeah, Strange Heart's cool because they're quite diverse, the places that it goes to and that's why it's called Stranger Heart. It's like all these very opposing strange parts of mm. my heart that I needed to know could fit all together and I wasn't crazy. Wow. Um, so I do have a question. I think it, I think it's almost like a little bit unfair to ask you. But Go for I'm, it. I'm going to throw it out there. Okay. Uh, what is it? Well, some of the songs are like, you know, they really get me mm -hmm. and like almost brings a tear to my eye. Aww. Have you written songs while crying? Well, I told, crying. I did warn you. I said it was going to be a cheeky question. Okay. And I have to really think cause nothing's coming to mind. Probably close to crying. Okay. Like Infinity Roses on this record, I wrote um, the day that my friend's mum passed away and we were we happened to be in the studio and it's a friend who we work with a lot and we got that um, call and like maybe instead of crying we wrote that song mm. and maybe, yeah, writing a song is like an outburst of emotion that you can't control for me anyway. Um, and crying is that as well. I don't think I've done them together, but it's, yeah, maybe mm. it'll happen. Okay. There's still time. There's um, hopefully still time, yeah. How do you feel about people figuring out the songs that you've potentially written about them? Is this a, a, a difficult thing, uh, you know, being authentic and being honest with your feelings, but knowing that the person that has inspired that song is going to hear Listen. it and might figure it out? Yeah, um, I've got some songs about some people that 
if they ever knew I would go to jail or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, that's a really fun thing as a songwriter to know that you d- you don't know and it, like a lot of the time it's too awkward to ask or let them know. Mm. Except, you know, now I have a partner and it's okay, I can just be a bit more open. But mm. previously, yeah, you know, these people would be like, oh, you're a stalker yep. or, you know, this is weird. Um, I picked up that vibe. Um, <laughs> oh, did you? Yeah. Cool. Like the girl from Wedding Crashes, like, I will find you. <laughs> yes. I'm getting that kind of vibe. Did you? No, not really. Don't worry, you're fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, at, but at the same time, you're like, if, if they knew, then good because often it's like a, you know, I don't know if I can swear, but like a fuck you. Yeah, go for it. Um, or, you, or you did that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, often it is something that you wish you could have said to them, mm. but you just can't because you're a pussy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, now, I do want to talk about the new clip as well, uh, mm-hmm. Later Flight. It really does have that nostalgia bomb effect. Okay. You yeah. Know, you've got the film burn, the, it's the 16 millimeter kind of aesthetic. So it's throwing back to a different era, like the late 70s, maybe early 80s. I was interested why that particular vibe and feel and era uh, really seems to attract you because it seems to have permeated the rest of your work as well. Well, I grew up listening to a lot of, I guess, 70s, 60s and 70s music in – Sorry, in the, I guess, folk movement of Joni Mitchell and Bob Dylan and then The Doors and The Beach Boys, um, yeah, Patti Smith. And I I really miss that feeling in modern pop music and that aesthetic. So I think it's really real and it reminds us all of like the earth that we're living on rather than like the, mm. the poppy electro Instagram universe so (laughs) uh yeah so I guess I'm always wanting to flatten the um the cinematography and stuff that we do and in my music I often trying to fill the singles with guitar and and definitely Mm. real drums and real things uh alongside all the electronica that I make and yeah I guess I just want that to stay and um for me it's just still romantic so Mm. Hopefully it doesn't get boring because it'll keep happening. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like the music that you were describing almost, uh, I mean, Desire the, the Horse. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh did, did, uh, was I not supposed to know about this? No, no, great. <laughs> um, First band. So uh, funnily enough, I rang Lisa Mitchell. <laughs> oh, my gosh, did you? <laughs> to talk to her about you. Uh, before we came in today and she was talking about how she first met you and you had a project called Desire the Horse and she described it as witchy and, uh, you know, ethereal and folky. Uh, When Mm. you look back at that project, how does it make you feel, I mean, uh, that kind of particular time of your music making? When I look back, oh, what a cool question. I think that I was, yeah, tapping into something that I'm still discovering in that, let me think yeah the songs were quite witchy and spiritual and um a bit doorsy and Mm. stuff um and understanding how like you know you just I I guess any artist is constantly understanding where your little pocket is in the world with production and and writing and you're like kind of speaking to a planet and you're trying to convert the message as best you can but Mm. it's a constant realization process Mm. and yeah funnily enough I feel like that place um obviously it comes through everything I make but uh right now more than ever I'm really referencing songs that I wrote 10 years ago um when I was first writing because that's when you're just not writing for anyone else but yourself and uh yeah those songs from Desire the Horse might even make an appearance like Mm. next year funnily enough wow. so you're picking up the vibe <laughs> yeah <laughs> um it's cool okay but great my vision was always like space pop okay cowboys and aliens oh cool yeah so yeah so we'll we're gonna try. get a, a few more uh space pop cowboys and aliens <laughs> uh in the, in the future, future. This next album were uh-huh. you talking i think so yeah i think it's it's always just also trying to understand again that balance between technology and camping and like you know the world we're living in is so strange right now it's Mm. so chaotic and 
uh, as a kid who grew up, you know, um, learning about floppy disks in year two <laughs> to like being on, you know, mm. Instagram and having a career that revolves somewhat around social media and stuff. Mm. It's a lot to like handle. So where is that balance and how can I express it in music, like the earth and the stars and yeah. It's so funny that you should uh, say this, uh, particularly comparing uh, you know, philosophy and science uh, because there was this incredible line that Lisa Mitchell said about you where she said that Holly's brain is always chewing on something. She always has a copy of New Scientist and New Philosopher in the same room. Uh, so, and I think that's a, a brilliant kind of reflection. Uh, uh, do you th- is that kind of what you're trying to do? Combine the worlds of philosophy and, and science and, and making them blend with your music? Yeah, um, absolutely. It's really cool of Lisa to say that. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I do. I've always, but she's right. <laughs> I buy a copy of like New Scientist or Scientific American and I'll buy The Economist at the same time and then you know, if I'm cashed <laughs> up by a music magazine too. Um, but yeah, I guess looking at what's happening in all of these worlds and trying to find um, how they connect, which obviously there's many people out there trying to do that, but I take that and um, I guess it bleeds into my production and secretly that's where the sound's coming from. Yeah. So yeah, it's, and I don't really get to talk about that too often, but that's, yeah, that's kind of the brain behind the sound that I'm personally wanting to make. Yeah, yeah fantastic. Mm. Add, adding some cowboys and aliens and I'm, I'm in. Yeah, Sounds cowboys, fantastic. aliens, the economist and yeah. <laughs> um, I really would like to talk to you about uh, Electric Lady. Mm-hmm. Uh, for, for those who aren't familiar, what what is Electric Lady? Electric Lady um, is a female-fronted concert series that I started in 2017 and for me, um, it was a reaction uh, for my industry to the women's marches and the incredible movement that uh, has grown to change the world, you know, and our country. Um, but at the time, the the balance in playlisting and, um, you know, concert programming, or like festival programming was way out. And I just thought, how great would it be to put um, female fronted acts on the same stage and also in the lead up talk to female leaders in all fields, um, science, economy, sport, music, and, uh, I don't know, just share their stories. So, you know, Triple J jumped on board and it had a really cool impact. I guess it's coming up to three years ago now or something, Mm. if I can do maths. Um, we then, um, created a stage at the Commonwealth Games, which is a, a big honor, um, and we did some stages at festivals and now I've partnered it with Secret Sounds and we're working on something amazing. So while we're talking about live performances, uh, South by Southwest in Austin, a mm-hmm. uh, huge, huge music conference, probably one of the more significant ones in the world because yeah. you uh, are inundated with the world's greatest musicians and a, a good performance over there can uh, literally propel you all around the world. Mm. Uh, tell me about how you're feeling about performing at South by Southwest. What's the game plan? How are we going to get in <laughs> there and, and do a great job? Uh, my after, I guess, doing doing music for a little while now and knowing why I'm doing it I'm pretty much coming in with zero expectations and just like whatever because I kind of just believe in consistency and releasing good music and people want to listen or whatever they Mm. can but um yeah won't be chasing the twister of South by Southwest okay but what have you heard about the, the the twister oh I guess I just see it as like a crazy buzzy swirly place of cowboys and aliens (laughs) (laughs) I don't know but I know that there's a lot of pressure Mm. put on artists uh in spaces like that and it's so amazing the opportunity and of course all the great people there but if you spent your time like chasing it then you'd be really exhausted and Mm. so I'm just gonna chill Okay. People come to my set if you want. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So for anyone watching overseas, make sure you, you come down, check yeah, your show out. Yeah, I'd love you to come. Okay, yeah. rock and roll. Now, uh, I did want to talk to you about your house, uh, mm. where you live. 
Cool. Uh, and whether that has, uh, you know, an, an effect on, you know, the sounds we listen to. Because I've been yeah. I've been told that you live, like, basically on the beach at Foster. Oh. <laughs> uh, and that, you know, you're a bit of a surfer girl. Uh, and, uh, you know, you've had to deal with all the monstrosity uh, mm-hmm. of the fires that are, have pulled through your mm, part of yeah. town. Um, t- tell me what, what happened. Uh, how, did you get evacuated? I'm from Foster, which is three hours north of Sydney. And my family live there and a lot of my friends. But I now live three hours south of Sydney in a similar town, um, Molly Mook. And both of those towns in the past three months have been uh, ex- extremely affected by bushfires. Mm. Um, Foster and the Manning Great Lakes was affected in late uh, November. And then us down south over New Year's Eve and early January, obviously, um, the whole of the South Coast was on fire, as we all know. So, mm. yeah, we uh, were lucky um, the fire didn't hit us where I live. My house is near, uh, like, bushland and mm. we did we evacuated and did our crazy fire planning and sandbagged the gutters and tied, like, sprinklers to the roof and had our local fire brigade, like, all these – testosterone pumped males having like a survivalist job all of a sudden were going around they were called like the narrowly fire brigade for us wow (laughs) just your general you know good Mm. local citizens um yeah but we were really lucky um people really close to us in lake conjola weren't so lucky it's really Mm. hectic what's happening and happened out there they were just flooded again last weekend so fire and flood um yeah, it's it's been a huge time. Mm. I mean, because I've been informed that you studied uh, climate science and, you know, it's why it seems you've been involved in so many different uh, events uh, and uh, trying to get really involved uh, in this kind of movement, really, protecting the country from climate change. Is, is there, is there yeah. more still on the horizon for you when it comes to, you know, raising money? Are there, are there more events that we can go to? Anything else we can do to get involved? Oh, well, um, Next week I'm playing Down to Earth, which is Gang of Views, Angus and Julia, Briggs, Thelma Plum, Tash Sultana and I. Oof. Yeah, so <laughs> it's pretty amazing. And um, I worked with Gang of Views, the amazing team on that, and helped to kind of look after funds distribution and understanding where we should and who we should distribute funds to so that was really awesome because we got to um well we're getting to work with fire sticks which is an indigenous land management kind of alliance and they're doing great work with education and information um and say like the emergency leaders for climate action they're the group of the 22 former fire commissioners uh who are demanding action and and doing a lot of really important you know, educational Mm. stuff too. So, yeah, being um, involved in that and uh, I guess helping to bridge the gap between politics and music is like my favourite thing to think about and do. And, yeah, this year I really – yeah, and next year I want to work hard to understand how, you know, young people can be heard. I Mm. think that a lot of young people are on the same page about what should be happening um, but we don't really have like the tools yet in Australia to speak, to have that really kind of long lasting impact mm. politicians. Yeah. Wow. So I don't know. Um, now we have been getting a few questions. So okay, I'm cool. going to uh, drop some in uh, from uh, Jono who said, uh, being a passionate climate change campaigner, do you feel even more fueled to make a positive impact? Uh, and what do you aspire to do to help? Okay. Um, thanks for the question, Jono. Um, yeah, I definitely feel more fueled in the way that I feel like the, the extremely terrible fire season, um, has made Australia kind of wake up to how serious, uh, you know, this long-term climate impact may be and our preparedness and, understanding even how politicians react and talk about it. It's like not okay. Uh, So number one, yes. I think that um, musicians and artists in our world that we get to live in every day, we have a really special way of speaking to people and understanding people and converting messages, you know. Mm. That's what a songwriter is. You're converting all this weird 
emotional information into a song. So I think that um, I aspire to see how songwriters can have an impact in Australia over the next few years and get to know more about the next federal election and how we're going to make young people's voices heard. Incredible. Well, that is yeah. that is something to aspire towards. I think yeah. that a little round of applause, surely. Oh. <laughs> Um, Luke, uh, in our studio audience, uh, says, what has been your favourite gig and can you tell us about supporting Florence and the Machine? Awesome question. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, oh, that would have to be my favourite gig, let's say. Also playing at the um, school strike for climate action. That was, mm. I think, 80,000 people and I didn't really remember it because it doesn't feel like it happened, but... Playing with Florence um, was insane because she truly is like my dream gal. She's your, your witch mother. She's yeah. my witch mother mm. um, <laughs> who I got to meet once and I hope I get to be best friends with her one day. But she's in the stalker pile. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> she's also <laughs> Holy renowned as being the sweetest woman in the world. Yeah, yeah. She was just amazing and I guess that night was cool. Everyone backstage knew how creepily obsessed <laughs> I was. <laughs> And it was really awkward because everyone was coming up to me being like, did you meet it yet? Did you meet it yet? And I'm talking like 20 people came up. Because everyone knew. Everyone knew. Please, you have to <laughs> p- paint us a picture. When when you first oh. saw her, where were you? Were you backstage? Well, How did it go? What happened? Okay. Um, well, firstly, I made her like a Welcome to Sydney witch kit. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I... Play it cool, play it cool. Here's my witch kit. (laughs) Literally didn't hold back. I felt like um, a 10-year-old that was on the set of the Saddle Club or something. Okay. Um, Yeah, so I made one for her and Isabella. Isabel? Isabella. Isabella Machine, her co-conspirator. And I was kind of, you know, when you've got something for someone and, like, you don't know when to give it to them and you don't know if you're allowed to speak to them and you just, like... A freak. So I was walking around backstage with these boxes and running into people and they were just like, not now, not now. And I was like, fuck, I feel like an idiot. Mm. Um, yeah, and so I think the first time I saw her, she was like pre-show and she was like very in the zone. In the zone. Yeah, okay. And I was like hovering around her with my box and like not feeling the vibe. And <laughs> People were just looking at me like, no, not now. And so I got really turned off like, and scared, you know, that it maybe wasn't appropriate for me to give her such a gift. And, um, yeah. <laughs> and then after the show, she did her amazing thing that she does, which is just mind-blowing. Uh, after the show, uh, she got the message that I was like a creepy fan and she came up and uh, gave me the best hug and I got to give her my witch kit and she's like I love you thank you Mm. so uh and we had this amazing conversation because I asked her like how how did you learn such witchery because she does stuff on stage that's clearly like being taught to her by someone on a mountain or something Mm. um and we had a great conversation about yeah what she's actually doing up there and it's legitimately you know, modern magic. Okay, so two big questions hit okay. me. Uh, firstly. <laughs> I've got butterflies. I, I'm just even thinking about it. <laughs> just going to take a breath. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, firstly, I need to know what's in the witch kit. Right, uh, I need to know. And, and secondly, um, you know, the what Florence is doing on stage. Uh-huh. Tell us some background. Do, do, do you know what she's doing? Is she doing enchantments? Is she doing some sort of magic? You need to explain. Oh, okay. gosh, this is good. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, in the witch kit, there was like some sage. Okay, and, important. Yeah. And um, a crystal and some oil, some like AU Sydney. It's made in Sydney somewhere, probably in Bondi. <laughs> um, yeah, and I picked one for her and one for Isabella. And I don't know, like, yeah, a letter if I haven't said that already. I think that's all that was in there. I wanted to keep it simple but yeah, No effective. tarot cards, you know. No. No voodoo dolls. Just no. <laughs> yeah. With pins. Yeah, that's yeah. enough. Three yeah. items or so. Yeah. So they both got that stuff. Um, and Isabella said she hadn't brought any perfume, so this was perfect. And I was like. Fantastic. Great. Um, yeah. And then talking to Florence, I guess it just. 
she said she has studied with some incredible um, witches. I'm not like witches, but witches uh, in New York, especially, and um, a movement kind of specialist. I don't know what that's called, but I can't remember their names right now. But basically, um, it's about kind of holding the energy of the audience and moving it around and like she does this thing and you're like is she eating my soul mm. and she probably is did, did she eat your soul i think so okay well um mm. should we ask her for it back or it's not us if you see her please say yeah okay. jack river would kindly request her soul back okay <laughs> i'll do that for you thank you Why do you have you a- met her Yes. Okay. I was well, going to tell you this after story? the interview. <laughs> okay, tell me I fell later. asleep in, an, uh, in a hotel room uh, when I was supposed to interview her because she was uh, a little bit late and I'd come from another country and, okay. uh, and and she gently shook me awake on the chest. Oh, my God. So she goes, hello, hello. It's like, I think you're interviewing me. And I was mortified. Oh, my God. Um, yeah, but hey, it's Maybe about she me. stole your soul. <laughs> she's, she's probably got my soul. Um, we've got another question from Kira mm-hmm. and I, I want to uh, – she's from Melbourne. Yeah. So uh, all the way from Melbourne, how do you measure – success as a singer songwriter and producer is it a certain gig you want to play at or is it a certain level on the music charts or is it a financial achievement uh when can you say yep i've made it that one's really complicated and hard and something that i think i'm still trying to understand about myself and my industry um obviously there's the normal things that you're kind of programmed like legitimately to achieve um and they are amazing things like playing splendor or playing coachella one day or um hitting a certain number of people that you play to and financially of course every artist needs to make a living and you give so much um i feel as an artist or a doctor or a nurse or whatever but uh, i you know it's a very wild west kind of industry so um it's really nice to be able to make a financial living but the real kind of answer for me I am finding is um, literally hearing someone talk to you about how your song has impacted them or receiving a letter or something. Um, but mostly that that face-to-face, this song has done this for me and saved me from this or helped me with this. That's like the only thing to me that feels successful. Mm. Um, yeah, and the rest is makes you feel quite isolated if you're chasing it like this many followers or this many likes or this much money or whatever. It and I I thought they were the things that um meant success, but when you start to kind of achieve some things that you had on your list as like I'll be successful, mm. you still feel empty unless you value why you're actually doing it, which is writing really great songs and giving them away to people and having them accept them into their lives. So Wow, fantastic. Yeah. That was a Long really, answer. That was a great question, a really, really great mm. uh, answer. <laughs> um, and as for uh, writing really great music, uh, I do believe that this EP is absolutely incredible. And the final thing I wanted to ask you before yeah. I let you go is I listened to it personally while overlooking the ocean and oh. the, the, the music came into my soul and I was just like, this is great. I'm having like a real moment. So if you could choose for mm. people to listen to your music in a location, in a scenario, in a place, at a time, how would you have people consume your latest EP, Stranger Heart? Well, I imagined, and I haven't done it yet, but I imagine walking through a dark kind of forest alone, like when I was making it. Um, And maybe I was thinking, you know, streets of New York always gets all the emotions, you know, streets of a city where Mm. there's lots of beautiful lights. But maybe it is like a kind of semi, not creepy, but like a little bit scary but beautiful kind of bushwalk on sunset or something Mm. where you're like, it's dark soon but I'm going to keep walking. Yeah. Yeah. Ideal listening scenarios. Uh, Yeah. Holly, may I say thank you so much for coming in and joining us here on Build. Thank you so much for having Uh, me. Round of applause. Thank you. For Jack River, her latest EP, Stranger Heart, is available right now. You've been watching Build. Build.